when you were doing this novel, mo most of the readers and listeners to this won't realize that at any given time, you're working on 12 different audiobooks. Yeah. And you're yeah. able to still give that level of attention to each author, to each line, to each character. I mean, yeah. so you between those 12 novels, you've probably got 100 different characters that you have yeah. to keep track yeah. of which yeah. is quite impressive. I don't know how you, you don't spread yourself so thin. Well, the, the way I do it, Steve, is is each time a character makes a first appearance in the book, I clip that piece of audio and put it in a file. I, for each book I do, I have a file of voices. And I might put some notes in there if they're particularly nasty or posh or something. So I've got a, a few little clues. So that when I come back to that character, if I can go, that one, how does she go? And I can go and I can listen to it. And then I go, okay. And then I've got them again, and then I'm in the zone for that character, and then I can move on and record the new piece. So it still sounds like, even if they were many chapters, you know, they've they've reappeared after they've, and every new character, even the smaller ones, like in your books, like the guards and the other soldiers, I'll I'll do them as well because you never know when they're going to come back. If you need help, I'll be down the hall preparing your aunt's bath, Yarden says before leaving the girls. Willow waves Yarden off then gently helps Anne to the tub and helps her remove her clothes. The bath water feels wonderful. Her tub is large, not as big as the bath in the slave quarters, but large enough for two adults. Anne is caught off guard when Willa jumps into the tub, naked as well. We can kill two birds with one stone. Turn your back to me. Extremely uncomfortable being cleaned by another person her age, Anne feels like a muddy retriever brought home from the lake. Don't get used to this, Lily. Once you're better, it will be you bathing me. I know you're in the military. Are you allowed to say where you are right now? I'm just in Alaska. You're in Alaska. So you're st still stationed with the military in Alaska? I am. You didn't get to go home for the holidays? Um, we got out the 23rd. I just didn't want to be traveling the day before Christmas Eve. Yeah. It just did not seem like a good idea. So we stayed. Um, yeah. I'm, with, I'm living with my girlfriend. And uh, we just decided that it would be better just to spend a quiet Christmas together. Okay. So that's that's nice that you're not completely alone. And you've got, uh, you've got the very... Alaska, you're going to get a white Christmas, I'm guessing? <laughs> Well, it's actually been a pretty good winter. Um, I mean, we get snow a lot, but for the most part, it's manageable. Uh, they clear the roads pretty quick. Um, actually, the roads where we live are much better than they are like in the center of Fairbanks. So it's easier to get to and from work. Um, but, but it is a little annoying. Every morning you walk out, there's more snow in your car. So you're just like, got to brush it off and... Just remind us which branch of the military you're in and, and can you tell us what you do? Obviously, I don't um, want to push you too far. I, mean, I don't want you to tell me stuff you're not allowed to tell me. Um, I'm in the Army and mm -hmm. I'm an 11 Bravo, so that means I'm in the infantry. Okay. And do you have a special uh, role in the infantry? Uh, right now, I am an armorer, so I take care of the weapons. Wow. So that's the sharp end. That's the proper stuff. That, uh, that's way too much responsibility for someone like me. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you, you've you got that and you're doing your duty and, uh, and thank you for your service. Okay, so I'm guessing the Army, you work long hours, quite stressful, literally making life and death decisions. Where do you find the time to write? Um, I, get, I take my time where I can. Um, most of the time, it's my, in my free time I spent in when I'm not like working out or spending time with my girlfriend or my dog. So I'll probably make an appearance at some point. They like to see what I'm up to. Yeah. Um, so, so I fit in a, to a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, it does get a little more challenging. Um, you know, as the more I'm in the army, the more responsibilities I seem to take on. But, you know, you make time for what you love to do. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, people just say, I haven't got time. You, you, you don't just get time. You have to make time. Yeah, it's all about being organized, and you must be uh, massively organized. Is writing an escape for you, then, from the military life? 
Um, I mean, it's always been kind of a, now I wouldn't even call it an escape. It's just something I enjoy enough to do that it's something that does take more importance than any of my other hobbies. So what we, I'm able to separate, you know, my vocation from my, you know, hobbies very yeah. well. Yeah. And then it's, I'm also snowed in right now and it's, <laughs> I, I only get like three hours of daylight, so I, it's not like I can really do that much. Like it's what, perfect what, conditions for a writer, sets. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Alaska yeah. is kind of like one of those um, places where you can just go and write. We had a uh, we did a train tour, me and my girlfriend, not too long ago. We got to go all over the uh, the Alaskan wilderness. So we went from Fairbanks to this area called Denali, which has the largest mountain in North America. Um, and then we went to uh, Seward, which is like this small little coastal frontiers like town. And then we went to Anchorage too. So we got to see a lot of different stops along the way. Um, and on our way from Fairbanks to Anchorage, we were going through this massive wilderness. And they were telling us there's just people that live in the wilderness year round. Um, a lot, some of them are writers um, and they just, that's how they live their life off the grid, no power, no running plumbing. They just sit out there and they write. Wow. And then when they need something, they flag down a train and either hop on or get some supplies. Well, to me, I'm picturing the shining, <laughs> 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 you know? but uh, at least he had electricity, but it didn't stop him going crazy. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about Anne's tale. This is a terrific book. It's the second book that we've done together into an audio book. Where did the idea come from? Because this is totally different well, to the last one. The last one was based a lot on reality. This one's more of a fantasy, isn't it? It's what I would consider an epic fantasy. Uh, there's a lot of elements. It uses my famous uh, multiple character views that I like to use so much. But yeah. this uh, was a little different. So... There was a prequel to this story that I wrote, and it was just kind of like an idea. And that was more world building. Like, I thought, all right, what would happen if we had a breakdown or shortage of natural resources? And I thought, well, you know, we'd go back to the old try and true systems. I mean, you know, kind of like functional republics and democracies are a relatively new concept. Yeah. I mean, you've yeah. got, you've had in, historically in, our society we've had monarchies that seem to find a way to last several thousand years so i thought like all right well it, it would be very difficult in north america to create a vast empire unless it was done through like a disgusting amount of violence so for the most part people would small form small city states and small little kingdoms yeah. So I thought, like, all right, well, what would be in this world? What would be like the most, the biggest assholes to try to expand out to the rest of the continent? I was like, well, I don't really like California, so let's make them the bad guys. Right. Right. <laughs> so, so that's that's where it was, because you've um, you've created a, an incredibly intricate world where lots of there's lots of power plays between different factions and also between different characters. I don't know how you keep track of it all. Well, uh, I have a central idea where I was building to. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've always been kind of fascinated by the concept of arranged marriages. Mm -hmm. I, I just find them to just be a very like, it, uh, and then the I find it kind of funny that at the same time, while it's something that's not like practiced very often, in parts of the world where it is, it has a higher success rate. Yes, it than does. Traditional marriage. Yeah, so, and even even when it's in, it, it, when when the culture is transplanted to another culture, and that and that culture within that culture, they seem to be more successful than the culture that surrounds them. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. So so yeah, it's weird, but at the same time, especially like in a in a system like what Anne's Tales built in, mm -hmm. they're they're for survival at the same yeah. time. Therefore. So there was a central idea I was building to. I don't want to spoil the series. No there's yeah. there's five books in the series. Right. So 
it was building to the point of an arranged marriage where the two people actually get along very well. And so I had to like build up to that. So I had to like, so Anne has a very unique progression. Um, so in the first, first novel that we've read, it's about her hardships, but it shows the skill sets that she has in order to continue to build upon that. Um, when she finally moves over to several of the other novels, you know, she built, start, begins to build her family, begins to build her power base. She proves that not only is she a, di a diplomat, a uh, lady of the court, but she's also can be a warrior when it's called upon. So I, I feel like she's got a, multiple layers. She's one of the greatest characters I've ever written. I, I love her progression, her journey. Um, and I ultimately love where it ends up. Now, where I'm writing the sixth book in the novel uh, series, there is a, um, so there's a prequel to this, which s takes place with the main character in the Nan's Tale, Thomas. So Thomas is, um, you know, he, he's got a pr uh, his own journey too. Yeah. But at the same time, he's this kind of perfect guy. She's this kind of wonderful woman. I wouldn't call her perfect. She's got her imperfections, but she's not a terrible woman by any means. She does whatever she has to do to survive and try to save as many people around her as she can or try to make their lives not as miserable. Whereas Thomas is, he's kind of really only out for himself. He, his whole life, he's been treated as this prince more or less where nothing, yeah. he can't do anything wrong. Things kind of always work out for him luck wise. So I just was like, you know what? This motherfucker has got to be smacked in the mouth. Like, <laughs> he, 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 like that's not the way life works. Like, yeah, eventually your luck will run out. Every, the thing every with Thomas is, though, he's not he's only he's a product of his environment. I mean, deep down, he does have redeeming features, but it's because, like you say, of his of his upbringing and the environment he's been, you know, not many people have told him no before. And that's why no. he's like that. Yeah. And the only one who ever tells him no is his father. And as we learned, his father is one of the most horrible people. Yes, his, fa his father does. His, his father is opposite. His father is inherently bad. Where Thomas, he's just ended up being brought up in a, in a bad environment. Yes. Well, James Royce Thomas's father is a very... I wouldn't say he's inherently evil. He has this ability to... He, he wants to he builds the world around him he's one of those few th there's few people in our in our world even now that have the ability to literally move oceans they have this ability to essentially make everyone else just puppets and whatever they're doing or they have the ability to control outcomes that otherwise a normal person wouldn't he has the money he has the resources but only not only that tactically he ha he's a military genius in a lot of ways. Like he understands like, all right, I need to end a war as quickly as possible. The best way to do that, well, let me kill all the people in this capital city. And yeah. to him, he has no problem doing it in such a dark and twisted way that we would just be like, all right, that's horrible. How could you do that? But to him, it spared the lives of his men and the army that he built. So he didn't want to go ahead and throw their lives away on a meaningless conflict. Everything that he does has a purpose where his yeah. sons are kind of simple minded in their desires. Like Thomas wanted to be home with his wife. So he knew that by embracing what his father wanted, he was committing untold evil, but to him, he thought it was justified. So they, they have their, they have their justifications for what they do in this novel. It's just that, every one of them have their own different ways of doing it. Yeah. And the way you write the characters so well is when I was reading it, I was getting a feel for them and I was, you know, I get to, I get to like and dislike characters, not, not based on how, how well or badly they're written, but based on the people themselves on whether I like them or not. And the one of them that was written so well was Thomas's wife. Um, she, I did not like her because she, you, a lot you of wrote, don't. yeah, but that's the idea, right? Is that you don't like her? She was, wow. She was worse than him as, as being a spoiled brat. I mean, that's what she was as a spoiled brat. 
Yeah. Well, she she was terrible, like as, yeah. as far as like being spoiled, but she was so much fun to write. Was she? Because yeah, oh, she she was a blast to write because I mean, <laughs> I had to think of like, all right, what? Because like everything that she does is like this. Oh my god, she just terrible. But like, it's the way she did things. Like mm. she was possessive over Anne because Anne, her father, bought her as a slave, and she literally turned a human being into a plaything. Yeah, her whole life, like yeah, into a toy. No, yeah, yeah. It, she, she had no problem doing that. She had no. She had no understanding of the fact that servants and slaves had feelings. <laughs> she had no understanding that no like, empathy whatsoever. She's a total narcissist. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. She. I mean, she hates <laughs> pets. She hates. <laughs> All the fluffy and furry things in the world, but she wasn't she, keen on her own baby. I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but she wasn't even keen on her own child. Well, no, I mean, well, you have to understand, and for especially like aristocracy, traditionally they don't raise their kids; they see them for an hour at tea. Yeah, like yeah, that, that, they, and they have a the wet nurse, and then when they get enough old, old enough to go to school, they send them to boarding school. They don't, <laughs> yeah, that still goes on. Well. I personally don't have a problem with boarding school, um, uh -huh. but at the same time, it, you know, you don't send a five-year-old to boarding school. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, some amazing characters. So, are there are any of the characters then? Do they have certain traits of people that you've met in in real life? Uh, well, the, one of the main characters, Phil George, is based mm -hmm. off one of my best friends, Phil George. Um, except you didn't for even change the George name? My... No, I, I told my best friend he could go ahead and sue me. Uh, <laughs> be, because uh, the distinct, because I have proof. Uh, the character in this story is cool. My friend is yeah. not. So okay. it kind, kind of works out. Uh, Phil, you're going to probably get mad that I said you weren't cool. But, I mean, you're walking around in a neck brace right now, Phil. He, got, he actually got into a car accident not too long ago oh so. no he's okay he's okay. okay he's just you know he's he's joined the world and having tinnitus okay <laughs> right and uh and it was okay with that because the character in the book is actually cooler than he is so that's okay you can <laughs> well, write that's up, my but if you write I them see, down you're not going to spill the beans on who they are yeah okay um, well then a lot of other characters um Thomas is kind of like more of an, I, I wouldn't say he's based on someone, he's more of an invention. Um, you know, he's handsome, he's strong, he's charismatic. Uh, I, so I was worried he, at first because he's a soldier and he has two dogs that he misses when he's away in the army. And I thought, that sounds like a writer I know. And then I realized, no, it's not Steve. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but no, I was worried originally. Me. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that he's definitely not me. Yeah. Um, I would say James Royce is more kind of based off my grandfather, except my grandfather hasn't committed any genocides that I know of. Was um, he that manipulative, your grandfather? As manipulative? No, as no, he, he went out manipulative, oh, oh. but just I very see. Oh, the, I, his overall character. Yeah, I, I get you. Yeah, yeah. You know, he. my grandfather is the kind of guy who doesn't suffer fools. So right. he's a very pragmatic kind of individual. James is just amplified into that. Mm -hmm. Um Let's see other characters. Sir Robert, uh, he's kind of mo more of a. I wouldn't say he was a bad dude in the in in the book. I mean, he's definitely. I mean, he does own slaves and everything, so he's a t he's terrible in the concept that you know he's willing to deprive individuals of freedom. Uh, but he's a product of his society, mm -hmm. so he. But at the same time, he's kind of weak-minded, uh, right. narrow-minded. So yeah. he was, he was perfect. He was a perfect person for James to kind of steamroll, get what he wants. And then once he has what he wants, he's like, all right, I don't need you anymore. Yeah. Um, Aunt Carol, I have two Aunt Carols. So uh, I like, I, I wouldn't say they're based on my aunts yeah. there, but I mean, I just thought it was a very, good name for a villain i mean she was she was the first villain Anne ran into and you're just like i want to see this lady die like <laughs> you, but and the no way spoilers that it out, no spoilers but it is what you want to see yeah yeah so mm. she was kind of like this raving lunatic um 
So she's combined with like a, another woman that I grew up with. I can't I can't say the woman's name because she would actually sue me. Okay. Um, <laughs> but Aunt Carol has uh, traits of a few different women I've run into in the world. Older women mm-hmm. when I was a kid, I was just like, God, is she awful? Uh, <laughs> but not my aunts. My aunts are decent ladies. There. Yeah, but, but you like the name of Aunt. Carol. Yeah, I just thought yeah. it's a, it has a, a, name. a and it has a good beat to it too. Aunt Carol. Da, da, da. Yeah, it's got. Yeah, it's oh, going. Watch out, Aunt Carol's coming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Damaris, uh, she was a girl. My aunt taught cosmetology, and she'd always describe this nasty woman who was kind of a pig uh, in class. Like she'd fart and burp, and she was really greasy. So, and this is a cosmetology class, it's a beauty class. And this woman could be the furthest thing from beauty, at least in my mind, how I pictured her. So I was just like, all right, you know, I got to write this pig into the story. Like, yeah. you know, she, she's going to be something yeah. interesting. Yeah. Because she doesn't care either that she's a pig. She has no, it's not like she's really bothered and she's really down about, you know, she wishes she was, any, she really likes what she is and doesn't really care. She's not that smart though, is she? No, no. She's yeah, kind of yeah. more of a brute, but, uh, she, you know, she can, she, she, will betray someone for as simple of a reward as a candy bar. I mean, yeah, she yeah. has no. Yeah, or a cake she, or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cake or, I mean, <laughs> I, I didn't, like, I, I wanted to get rid of that scene where she's eating all the butter. Uh-huh. But I was just like, you know what? It defines because, her. Well, well, that actually happened in the cosmetology class. Apparently the girl was just, yeah, you know, those like little, buttercups that they serve at like a lunch or buffet yeah. so yeah. like when in so like they had a few of those at the school so she took like these little hands of the things of butter they're single serving and was just eating them like they were like candy so i was just like okay wow. that's right okay well she'd have to have a cast iron constitution to do that ah. yeah okay <laughs> now this book uh, and i'm only comparing it to the last book this one is a lot, shall we say, racier than the, uh, or spicier uh, than the last one. I don't want to give too much away, but there's um, there's a bit more graphic detail in, um, shall we say, more intimate pursuits. Um, oh, why we're is that? About the sex scenes. Yes, we are. I'm just skirting around. Oh, can you tell I'm English? <laughs> we- <laughs> <laughs> yeah so there is there is a lot there is a lot of a lot of sex in it why why did you decide to ramp it up for this one well with, with, in this kind of context um so for volume beneath the magnolia it just didn't play in the overall plot of the story yeah um, because there was this, a more innocent relationship wasn't there the, the love interest yeah. in that one it was it was a more innocent relationship yeah so uh, and there was so much more focus on the in falling beneath the magnolia there's more focus on the magic there's more focus on the mob yeah. violence especially in the second so, half of the book yeah so yeah. there were sex scenes written for that one right. it was just i i didn't want i i don't like to throw out 500 page books i i hate fucking seeing a giant tombstone <laughs> um so i try to write because like 90% of the world now doesn't have time to read. So like right. to find people that already have time to read, you don't want to give, you want to give them something as easily to digest as possible. Yeah. Where the difference with Anne's tale is it's a passion driven novel. Yeah. So for those that like sink into the book, that passion is kind of what they're craving at the same time as the violence. So yes. those kind of went hand in hand together. Right. Um, Cause there's a lot of different like elements to the passion that is there. Um, especially it all depended on the characters themselves. Yeah. So it does you know, help, it, it does help define um, some of the characters. Once again, I don't want to say too much, but the way that it's written and their attitude towards it does does help to define the characters as well in the early stages, especially, yes. Yeah. So the entire series does feature various elements of passion in it, but yeah. they're unique to the characters themselves. Not right. every character's sequence is going to 
operate the same way. So yeah. there's certain ones that are just like, uh, like Thomas's wife, for, wife, for instance, her scene differs from, say, Anne's scene. Anne's yeah. is a lot more, I would say, dignified. Yeah, at the like, very beginning, there's some abuse in there, but yes, it's more dignified as we as we get into a proper relationship. Yes, yeah. I mean, we we open the book up with a very very graphic and horrific sequence. Um, yes, it's more or less, and it's not a spoiler. Um, Anne's society, her her kingdom, is conquered by a massive empire. And everyone that doesn't get killed is sold into slavery. Yeah. And, you know, she was free, a person that lived free. You know, she's a child. She kind of was like, oh, well, they'll never come in. They can't get past the gates. And they do. And she then realizes, like, very, very early on that the world isn't fair to, to people. Mm -hmm. So she kind of just exists for a time period. And then she gets... You know, we, she, she, and then she kind of lives like a little bit naive. She doesn't really understand like the difference between someone wanting her or loving her. And then she kind of wises up to it. Um, whereas Thomas's wife, you know, she knows she's beautiful. She knows she's desirable and she has no problem going out and taking what she wants. Mm. So to, you have two different women that live in the same household that have a, that both go down their different roads to passion but both of them end up in different places mm -hmm. so i it, yeah. i because I, I don't want to just throw in a sex scene for no reason i don't no 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 it there. does it does help define the characters and also where they are on the journey they're going in because all of the characters seem to go on a journey in this book and they did in the other book too they then they're not the same at the same kind of people really at the end of the book because of the experiences they've been through as they are at the beginning. And, you know, and even for Anne, you know, she grew up, she was basically a peasant, but she was happy and she was free. And she probably thought she was already at the bottom of the social structure until she got sold. And then she was even further behind, even though she'd moved up into an environment that was in, a, in, an, in an upper class. So it was an amazing experience she had through her life. And you can feel even in this first book, the development of her, mind you, she does start out as a child, so she is going to develop along the way. But it is great the way you've written it. It really is, Steve. Uh, I enjoyed it immensely, um, recording it. And the artwork is fabulous, too. There's a little hint of it there at the bottom of the screen. But the artwork, and the artwork on um, Magnolia was good as well. Um, where did you, where, where do you get the artwork from for these books? Well, I don't want to give away all my secrets, but I do have, like, just like I have marketing guys, I've got cover guys. Yeah. So they uh, they do a very good job of taking what I want and be, uh, get, and giving it the best way. Um, so I wanted Anne to have a scene of an apocalypse, because it's more or less an apocalypse for her. Yeah. I mean. You know, she's literally diving into the fires of hell almost. Yes. So the, the cover was very eye-popping. You know, yeah. it's very, you know, and, and then she looks and then the the, the uh, actress or model or whatever she is in the, the book, she's very elegant, very beautiful, just like Anne is. Yeah. And it really, it tied well together. It's probably my, one of my favorite covers. Yeah, yeah, I really like it. I think it's... Uh... It just looks classy. It's just it just looks like, you know, this is something. It just makes it look really interesting. You see it and you think, well, what is her story? And then you realize it's called Anne's Tale. <laughs> so it's going to be in there. And how did you find the process of turning this audio book, sorry, this book into an audio book? I found it very smooth. I mean, we that's why I like to work with you. I found it to be a very smooth process. Um, it's very interesting nice to understand like i wrote this novel in probably a month and because i was so into it so the first draft was done within i i want to say 27 days was was the, the time frame um 
it was back when I had a lot more time on hand. So I spent a lot of time on this novel, like hour wise. So to finally see it or hear, no, to hear it uh, really kind of painted the picture for me in the best possible way. So okay. it really, it was kind of like, uh, it was very gratifying to, to actually see how this novel has was laid out. It gave, it, I mean, I'm very proud of all my novels, but I was very proud to hear the, how this one turned out. Um, my favorite thing to do was, you know, to get those updates like, hey, I upload the next four s chapters. So I'd go in and be like, all right, I've got to find time. So as soon as I found time to listen to it, I was just like, oh, this is incredible. So I, th I was, I would actually listen to this at the gym and like on my headphones. <laughs> so it was, um, it, de it definitely was a, a great process. Um, you know, that's why I want to continue working with you. I find the way you do things to be probably the most professional out there. Well, thank you very much. Well, it was a joy to write. And that's probably a, a good way to listen to it at the gym because a lot of people will end up listening to it while they're doing something else, either at the gym or driving or doing some work, housework or whatever. It's probably actually a really good way to experience it is while you're doing something else rather than sitting and trying to concentrate. Maybe you can remove yourself a little bit from being the writer. You know what I mean? And be just the listener uh, a little bit more. A little bit easier but i'm so glad because it and thank you for choosing me and i'm glad you're saying we can work together again because i'd love to work on more books with you because they are fabulous i mean they there's there's a richness to them and this one being a world you'd created as well but it was in my mind so vivid and so real and it made although it was some of it was outrageous it made perfect sense um it was grounded in it sounds mad to say that a fantasy book was grounded in reality, but they were real issues that real people deal with. And, uh, well, and that that's what's so unique about it is there's no magic to it. There, like there's no, there, no. Like a lot of fan, a lot of epic fantasies. They have to add some kind of fucking dragon to it or <laughs> some creatures that they have to fight when we've got enough monsters to deal with, with humanity. So, and that and then the fact that they have to contend with um, human emotions they have to contend with hubris with all sorts of different elements to how humanity is built up that it gave the perfect cannon fodder for it i mean yeah. we have especially because i use locations that i know very well and i was right. just like all right well what would this look like 800 years in the future with limited electricity and how how could I turn these people into something different? Because each culture around the continent is unique. I mean, you're going to see as the series progresses, there there are other societies like um, there are individuals from the French Quarter. They're called the Florida Lee, um, and they live in a very progressive, laissez-faire French society. You know, everyone's having menage a trois and. They're kind of got their heads in the cloud, but like the French, they're easy to defeat in combat. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know about your military, but our military, the British military, they, they, the French are known as cheese eating surrender monkeys. I don't know what the, <laughs> that's what they're known as. I, I know that for a fact because I did a, a memoir, a, a British soldier. I did his, um, I did his um, memoir and uh, cheese eating surrender monkeys is just what the French are known as. I don't know if the well, American, share, American military has a similar name for them. Yeah. Well, see, as an author, I try not to like offend any of the people that I write in locations, except the people that live in Paris. I hate those people. <laughs> They are the nastiest, most narcissistic cigarette smoking assholes I've ever met. The only thing, the only good thing you're going to get in, or the only thing you're going to get in Paris out of it is secondhand smoke. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, but yes, they're more or less, we, we know the French are good at two things, making champagne and surrendering. <laughs> okay. And that will be exposed in, in in a forthcoming book, will it, as well, the the French character? Uh, that'll be in Age of Queens, which um, 
features an intercontinent mass conflict. Okay. So the war breaks out across the whole continent, and there's a big power shift that eventually sees Anne kind of, she falls into a massive position of leadership that allows her, I, I think for the fans, it's gonna be very gratifying for them to see. Um, right. Because it's kind of like a culmination of everything, you know, because that they're gonna see her get to become a warrior. They're gonna see her become a leader, a military commander. And she's always had the grit for it. Yeah. So she just had to go out and take it. It was more, she was, you know, the, the responsibility was thrown on her shoulders and she ran with it. And you're gonna see that in the book that follows that, there is this kind of like, all right, well, now you have, you, you, there's a difference between winning a, a nation and maintaining a nation. So she's got to kind of balance that kind of when, you know, when everyone loved Winston Churchill do, during the war, but once, once the fighting was done, they're like, all right, well, we need somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Which I would have just left him there till he died. But. Yeah. Things, things didn't end well for Winston politically did not, uh, but in politics, I don't think things ever, ever end well. So maybe that but, was I just... mean, he was a brilliant military yes, commander. Was. I mean, uh, he, and also he, an inspirational speaker too, and an author. But but an inspirational speaker, which is what this nation needed at the time. It needed to believe that they could defeat this massive power to the south, and uh, and, and he made people believe. You know, when he said, "We will fight them on the," you know, "We will never surrender," and people were listening yeah, to that all over the country. Can you imagine Johnson giving that speech? <laughs> <laughs> Hair no one would believe it. No one would believe him. Yeah, but like Benny Hill giving it. Yeah. Well, I mean, but, I'm sure. Well, I mean, you know, Winston Churchill. One one thing I do love him. The man loved his wife. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure mm -hmm. Boris Johnson loves whoever the cor current wife is. That he has. <laughs> the current Mrs. Johnson. Yes. Uh, and because he was famously interviewed over here, and he was asked a simple question: How many children do you have? And he wouldn't answer, or he couldn't answer. He didn't know. He, this is, there, there, you know, there, there was one th theory is he really didn't know. Uh, oh, he wasn't willing to tell anyway. So I also find I do you, take a lot out of British culture in form and how I formed a lot of the aristocracy yeah. in this novel. Mm -hmm. And I find your parliamentary system to be so fascinating. Really? In what way? The fact that we don't have an elected upper house? Well, yes, I, I, I think it's kind of interesting that because of someone's birth, they are put, put automatically into a position of leadership. Yes. And with yeah. massive influence. Yeah. Yeah. The Lords, the Peers, the, the House of Lords, they uh, it's there's hereditary um, peerages. They're, they're born a Lord, which means they go to the House of Lords and the House of Lords, the upper house, like your Senate, things have to get through the upper house to make it into law. They can block it or at least make sure that it's amended so it fits their rules and regulations. And yeah, and then also politicians, it's the politicians who appoint um, the lords and a lot of them, are, are, you know, a lot of them have paid their way in there. Let's just, let's face it, you know, the world is corrupt. Well, I've always, well, it's corrupt and I'm always fascinated with how the British, like, upper house and the, the monarchy... I'm, I'm always like, well, what's really stopping them from like banding together? Uh, then again, I mean, the last time the peerage and the monarchy tried to basically control the people, you know, wasn't it Charles II that lost his head? And so there was a few of them lost their head. I could, there's there's that many lost their head and and that many yes, but when it when there's friction, it doesn't it doesn't end well. So the modern monarchy like to say that they stay out of it. Prince Charles, as King Charles now, but when he was Prince Charles, he used to have quite a lot to say about um, even things like architecture and certain uh, government bits and pieces. Since he's been king, he's not said anything. He's still a little bit vocal on the environment, which is amazing considering how many castles and houses he has and how he travels everywhere by helicopter, you know, that he's, he's telling us how to be more environmentally friendly, which just shows you how completely out of touch he is. Yeah. Well, it's a terrific book. It's the first in a series. It's Anne's Tale. 
the path to, uh, path to redemption Anne's tale path to redemption is the full title by steve farley there's a link if you're watching this on youtube there is a link in the uh, the youtube version of this where you can click on it and it'll take you to amazon and you can download yours so what is next then you've talked about this as a series is that what is that the next thing you will be working on next one in this series or are you going to do something else um, well, I'm working on I'm working on three right now. Um, so my attention is so I've been working on the sixth book in the series, um, and I would say it's probably about forty percent written. Um, I know how it's going to end up. It's yeah. just like it's got about a lot of moving parts to it. Um, there's a lot of character development going on. Uh, things are going to come full circle. Um, so there's 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 a lot of moving parts to it that are still uh, being worked out, um, and then also there are a few other elements with the story I want to play with because ultimately I want there to be a seventh and an eighth, um, but I don't want to string it out too long. Um, so I, I just want it to be done the right way. There's another uh, there's a spy thriller I'm working on. Um, oh which takes place in the island of Mykonos in Greece. One of my favorite places in the world okay. to go. Yeah. Um, there, and then what, what is the other one? Um, there's another one I'm working on. Obviously, it's not that good because I can't remember it. <laughs> no, it'll be, it'll be that good. And uh, no, I know it'll be good because the last two have been just brilliant books to work on. Just brilliant. So wow. did you have a favorite part to Anstale? I like the battle scene. I think we uh, didn't we use that in the the retail sample as well. The battle scene. I think we did. Yeah, I like that because there was so much going on. I did like well, that. But I, when it came to writing the battle scenes, I wanted because like all right because they're short on natural resources. So vehicles, while they have a role, they don't really have that much of an overall presence right now in this story as like massive conflicts break out you'll see them used more and more but at the end of the day it's a guy with a rifle on the back of a horse so think horses automatic weapons and because you're on horse you're gonna need, you're gonna need a sword because at some point you're gonna run out of ammunition so like when you combine those elements it makes for an incredible action sequence so i mean you know there was nothing like I mean, I love horses, but there's nothing like riding a, a, a rocket being fired into a tightly grouped cluster of soldiers and there's body parts everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Blowing into the horn directs his men into a second charge. At near top speed, Percy smashes into another horse and Samuel is thrown from his saddle, landing on his leg. Stumbling forward, Samuel limps on his left leg. His rifle broke off his rig and is lost amid the chaos, so he only has his sword and a sidearm. Samuel braces himself as an enemy horse comes barreling toward him. At the last second, a Tuscan rider smashes into the side of the enemy's horse, knocking the animal clean off its feet. Steve Farley, thank you. All right, take care, Grant.